uh, anyways, I I want to tell about some things I observed at the Flames game after this thread of the conversation's over, because we do stats on shots. Or maybe I'll just do it real quick. We do stats on shots. I've got this one mother that does stats on everything and, and cheers the whole time, too. I don't know how she does it. But <laughs> anyway, we average about in a 45-minute game about 55 passes. So I thought, I'm going to watch the Flames. I'm going to count their completed passes. And they're playing L.A. and they've got clobbered the game before. So in the first period, uh, they made 92 successful passes. Second period, and they, they had a power play then. Second period, 110. I think they had two power plays too, that, that, that boosted. And they had a 2-1 lead. So they went into a bit of a shell and they were doing that flip out of the, out of the zone quite a few times. And LA was really pressing. They made 62 passes. So they they made, you know, and then in a game, you, equal game, each team gets a puck about 21 minutes in a 60-minute game. And uh, so that's like 12 passes a minute they're making when they are on offense. And I just wanted to see that because uh, the comparison between the highest level and that's the biggest fault in, you know, in hockey below that level is people just carry the puck. And that's how we win. We back pressure the puck carrier because we know they're never going to pass. And, uh, you know, I, 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 that's the first time I've ever done that. So they made 260 passes in the game, which wow. is 205 more than we make in our good games. So, <laughs> Successful passes, Tom, not just yeah, only completed passes. Yeah. yeah How many attempts it. at the Flames level was there? Attempts? Like I how many missed passes? Success. Well, they made 260 that went and the guy caught the pass. You know, they, they don't miss passes. You know, sometimes right, so they, are they making are they only missing like 20 a game or something? Like what's the I'll sure. bet you like pucks that hit sticks, I'll bet you there's less than 10 that hit the stick and they don't take them. There that I think that's the biggest difference, hey Tim, is the pros they do not miss passes. Yeah, they, that's a it's a big skill we really tried to focus on with the Danish team, um, you know, pass re reception uh for sure. But that, those are very interesting stats, Tom. I, as you were talking, I, I, it'd be really interesting to, and maybe, I'm not sure how many of the world games, the women I can I can get access to down here because I still don't have a TV really set up yet, but uh, um, do the same stats for the Women's World Championship and see where they're at. And I guess, you know, with Sam, you, you know, obviously in the course of a game, even NHL games, there's, there's the odd bad pass that totally misses the mark, or there are some that failed receptions or whatever. Um, and I think that's what Sammy was asking. It'd be interesting to know kind of uh, how the percentage sort of falls there, like successful versus unsuccessful. Well, what I did is I made, I, I push transition, right? Like, because I think we coach the game the wrong way. We coach the game like it's soccer or basketball, like you have the ball forever. But in hockey, the puck turns over team to team about six, seven times every minute. So your team on an even, in a good level of hockey, your team has a puck 180 to 200 times. And the other team, the same thing. If they're like that game LA, the shots were 33-33 at the end of the game. It was a pretty even game. And then about 18 minutes, the puck is loose. You're battling for loose pucks and all this kind of stuff. So I think that really influences how we have to coach the game. It's not, uh, Bjorn Kending said, hockey's more like tennis than it is like basketball because you're going one team to the other to the other all the time. Power plays and that are, are different. They're more like soccer and basketball, right? But, uh, you know, so... That really influences how we have to work on things in a game is the transition all the time. So that, it's that's a, why I found the passes. I just was really interested to see how they, if they're better than my U13 team, and they are. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's, a, it's a bit of a chicken or the egg too, though, Tom. Like, totally agree that hockey is way, way more random, way more transitional than 
soccer, basketball, but also the way we coach affects that transition. And there, I don't think there's enough emphasis on possession. You know, the NHL teams, they totally focus on fire it up, chip it deep, go chase it. They add to the transition nature of the game because they're afraid of the mistake and the failure. And I, I think coaching wise, there's, you know, there's, there's more of it now, but there's room for us to emphasize more possession than the vast majority of coaches embrace. It's really, it's a space and area game at the NHL level. Um, you know, it's changed a little bit in the last 10 years, but I think there's still room for more possession in the game, even even inside the fact that it's it is a transitional game and a random game. Oh yeah, that with the with the shrinking the zone and all that, you have to, you know, either go high high and across, or you know, behind the net side to side and up to spread the defense because there's no yeah, there's no room if you the cycling in the corner is gone. You can't do that anymore because they they've got four players and against your three. But yeah, yep. I see a lot more scissors than there used to be. And yep. the other thing that I see is uh, since they moved the blue line out there, I don't know, 10 years ago or something, that, that's a big area above the circles. And I thought Chicago, when they were really good, was the first one to take advantage of that a lot more. Now all the teams are doing a lot of stuff up high and a lot of, you know, a lot of face-off plays and all that up high too. Yeah, I mean that's all changed dramatically in the last ten years to the to the good to the positive. I think that what what I was talking about or I meant maybe didn't say clearly enough. It's more through the neutral zone on attack. There's way more uh, room for emphasis on possession. Um, you know, NHL coaches are deathly locked for the most part in the just gain the space don't worry about possession mode. Um, and there's some merit to that, of course. Um, but I think we could do a better job of balancing, uh, you know, when you're like, for instance, when you're approaching the offensive blue line, if you have a little bit of time and space, but you don't have support, instead of just throwing it in and chasing it, why not try it? Like they do, like we all do three on three. Why not turn it back, keep possession, and try to reform an attack. There's a bit more room for that, I think, still in, um, especially at the NHL level where they're so skilled and they should be able to make those judgments and really minimize turnovers. But anyway. I'm amazed that at um, the NHL level, they find any space in the offensive zone. Yeah. I mean, whenever, you know, I'm watching women's hockey, the average height is maybe 5'7". So the reach is not, you know, what the guys have. And say guys being 6'2", 6'3", um, and we play, our home rink is Olympic size ice. Um, now we play, obviously, on the NHL a lot, uh, rinks, but whenever I watch an NHL game and I go down at rink level and how big the guys are, they just seem like they are taking the entire space when you put those 10 guys in an offensive zone, how they find any space. That is always so incredible to me. Um, so it makes so much sense, Tim, that you find the space before you enter the zone. Mm -hmm. And I, I totally agree. And uh, that, that exact same thing, when I first started coaching, this would be like 30 years ago now, I was coaching in medicine at, uh, you know, that's a pretty darn good level of hockey, um, major junior. But, you know, I, you know, I coached September through December. We had a little break at Christmas. So uh, I went through Calgary to go back home to Vancouver where Barb was going to school. And I went to a, practice pregame skate the flames they're playing la and even coaching in major junior i went to the practice and i'm like oh oh my god it just like hit me you know standing sort of rinkside just yeah, how saying, big they all the are size and the speed and the mm -hmm. like that was oh um Yeah, so I, I think Tom, Tim's frozen for me, but I think it's fascinating, Tim, Tom, when you say that there's cycling is gone. Um, you wouldn't say it's gone from 
the other levels of hockey, would you? I mean, I feel like at our level, it still is certainly there. And when I say no, level, there, I mean there maybe isn't more much size. Because they just, they, you know, they're they're shrinking the zone, so everybody's in the corner. You know, you're taking away the little pass to to, to the boards and below the net, and they're they're double teaming. You know, so there's not a lot of room, so you got to get the puck away from that crowd of people, and you know, and that that's what they do. They have to put it either high or across to create some space. Other levels of hockey, well, it just every it's just not it's just so much faster at the NHL level. But, uh, you know, other levels, you can still cycle and they don't cover as well and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. The reach isn't maybe quite the same. Yep. Oh, yeah. Like, is it more, I, uh, six foot six? Mm -hmm. I'm listening to you talk and I'm, I'm really glad that Tom brought up his U13 team and the stats that the mother was keeping. And you brought up the idea of, well, gee, there's still cycling at your level. And Tim's talking about the flames and the possession game. Well, I'm more concerned about the developmental side. And I believe that what Tom did, keeping track of the number of passes, not the just completed passes, valuing the pass, his team possessed the puck because of that. They worked on passing skill. They worked on support, but they did more passing, uh, decision-making type passing in games, competitive small area games that were f reflected in practice. Now in elite hockey, boys hockey, minor hockey, growing up right to the U16, 18 levels, it's one on five. They carry the puck as far as they can. If they make a pass, two passes in a row, wow, that's really great in, in boys hockey. Well, Tom's team, I've seen them make five in a row. So that's the first, the essence of the game is to be aware, use one another, and possess the puck. And so what Tom did at that age level uh, they're going to have to cope with the game as it moves up. And I, this is where I wanted Hal and Jordan. I don't know if Jordan's still at his desk in the office, but yeah, Jordan's experimented with more of this stuff. I've seen his team, uh, U18 AA, scissor the puck. I've seen them cycle the puck very well. Low zone offense. And <clears throat> Hal, I'm wondering how this fits into your conversation. You were talking about possession and turnovers at the blue line in the presentation I accidentally had on my phone when uh, this morning when I woke up, and, and it was last week's session. But I wonder if you could talk about this, your level, what's working for you, what you did that worked better, and if Jordan's there, just to tie it in, and we will talk a little more, I'm sure, about the NHL level because I've always said that's the sort of the ultimate level of hockey IQ and skill that you're going to witness that we're striving for, even with these kids, sooner than later. So, Hal, can you comment a bit? Sure. Um, I mean, this is so great. This stuff's all right on. This team I just had, um, they couldn't make two passes in a row, or the puck was rolling when it when it arrived, uh, with the exception of one kid who thought every pass was a slap shot, and nobody could catch it. And um, we did uh, for a while focus on having somebody track how many passes, uh, successful passes, and the other issue really is the is catching the dang thing and um you know the youth youth players tend to at least my experience is you know they get it off their stick and jet it in the general vicinity of where it's supposed to go and then they think it's that person's you know responsibility to uh to figure it out when it gets there and they and, the, and the passer is um is kind of out of the play um 
but I, it's one of those skills things that um, when we were, when you sent that thing out, Wally, about stick length, and, you know, I, I talked to my players about it at our after season party, because some of them in their skates, they have their stick length is up their nose. And these are the kids that can't catch a pass. And or if they're defensemen, they can't get the puck out of their feet when they're on the blue line. And, uh, you know, the issue of getting the blade flat on the ice and keeping your knees bent. And and uh, my experience, and maybe this is not true, Sammy, but from coaching girls for a couple of years, they bend their knees a lot more than the boys do. And I don't know why that is. Um, but they're down low a lot, especially the better players. And uh, from my experience, so that was U15. I wonder if that's just a flexibility um, thing. I think of somebody like Jennifer Bottrell, who skates so low and has such a powerful stride. No. Um, yeah, you're right. Lots lots do. Uh, I wonder if they've had to do it to to generate strength, like if it's the biomechanics they've had to make up for it, or it is simply is the flexibility that allows them to get it down. Well, I know a lot of the boys I've coached, their hip flexors are really tight. There's a lot of things they can't do. Uh, they can't do Mohawks very well. There's a, just a lot of structural issues that some of the kids have. But the passing my, thing is so My great. experiential observation would be the opposite that um, there's a lot less knee flexing in the female game generally, which I always kind of attributed to, uh, you know, probably in a very general way, not the best players, of course, but uh, a lack of leg strength. But my, my experience would be the opposite, not saying I'm right. I'm just saying I have a different, I have a different sense of it. <laughs> Tim, my my uh, when you brought up uh, Sammy brought up Botterill, she played ringette until grade twelve. That'll do it, and for that sure. does it because the stick length they're leaning on the stick. I think hers even more so was her mom was a uh, Olympic speed skater, so oh, I think she helped. learned <laughs> that lowness. Like Danielle Goyette, like Goyette, Goyette learned um, skating from the speed skaters, right? So. Yeah, incredible strides. Good skater. But the pass, well, I, passing ahead, skills. Yeah, are, I'm just, uh, I'm glad we're on this area because uh, I'm sure we'll get more listeners talking about the NHL and people getting excited about that. But the meat of the matter is we want to raise the bar of the game and it starts with kids learning and growing up and doing the right things technically and ethically. And that's what, you know, we're sort of trying to be all about. And I'm really glad for the progress being made in the game. And I just have to mention, Sammy, before you joined, I had my phone in my back pocket. It bumped. And all of a sudden, I'm listening to last week's Sharks edited sessions. And uh, it's actually quite amazing. And I don't know how many of you have them on your phone. But if you're driving anytime and you just want to listen to anyone, honest to God, it's amazing what all of you, all of we, come up with in these discussions. Now, they go all over the map, but they are really sort of consummately looking at the nature of the game today, where it is, where it could be, and what we're doing. So these conversations are great, and I do hope Jordan gets on.